Some exchange betting companies run short-lived promotions, like months-long offers of low commission. At BetDag, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDag is changing for the better. For the better, like you. BetDag, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly. Hello and welcome back to another very special episode of the Roker Report podcast. To talk about his time as chairman at the club, opposite myself sits a man who joined us in 1997 from Manchester City, went on to score 67 Sunderland goals. He's been a player, a manager, a goalkeeper, a chairman, all for Sunderland. And he's a man who got on the wayside skin almost as much as we got under his. It's uh, Mr. Niall Quinn. How are you doing now? Yeah, well? great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, delighted to be here. Good. So we'll start right at the beginning of your time as chairman. Sunderland plummet out of the Premier League with a record low points total. We looked dead and buried from about December. What possessed you, <laughs> and I'll use that word, to start thinking about getting investors involved and buying Sunderland, and what was your process? Yeah, so how it came about was uh, Bob Murray, Sir Bob as he is now, got in touch with me. He was worried about where the club was going and wanted to protect the foundation and asked would I uh, come back and do some form of role at the foundation. And that's where it started. I met Bob. And it then went, well, look, you know, things are going well in Ireland and uh, there might be some money in Ireland. And he, he opened the door to that and we kind of collaborated for a little while on how a, a, a deal or an attempt to um, bring money into the club from Ireland might look like. I set about doing it then with some uh, really good people, the Drummerville Consortium, as they were known. And it started to happen. And eventually, you know, three or four months later, it, it got real legs and we uh, we entered into negotiations with the club. And with the board of the, the PLC board, which uh, although it wasn't active because Sunderland had been part of the Blue Book Rules of London due to being a, a PLC within seven years, there was uh, there was a lot to consider with people who had shareholdings, etc. from outside the, the club's board and, and direct shareholders that uh, that had to come into consideration. So it was quite a, an arduous process, you know, to, to buy a former PLC and to, um, I suppose, plan and help protect the club and go forward and, and Bob was very open at that time he didn't have many options and uh, as worried as he was for the foundation I think he was just as worried for the club and wanted to find a, a good successor to him. So when it comes to finding a manager I'm probably skipping forward quite a bit but there you go as far as I'm aware Roy Keane was always your first choice. Yeah before the deal went through uh, Roy kindly came over to one of the Drummerville members' house and we, we got together to, to have a chat about it, all of us, not just Roy and I. And it went really well and it looked as if we were, uh, you know, all set to um, to go forward with with Roy coming in at the same time as the announcement would be made that the, the, the club was, was going to be bought. Assuming that happened, like we, we, we'd explained that we're not quite there yet, but if, if it'd be great to have him wrapped up, should it all come through. And uh, that that. That went very well. We, we thought we were there. And then as it went through, uh, Roy had second thoughts. He'd literally just walked out, out of his football career or, or finished his football career, I should say. And um, he, he wanted to go on a holiday, have a think about things. So we, we pressed ahead with the deal anyway. And uh, it was um, always his for a period of time. So I went in and... Uh, took literally, you know, overnight said, okay, we, we, they played a game in Shelburne in Ireland and I, we went to it. I travelled back with the guys and the next day I sat behind the, the desk for the first time and the day, a day or two after that it was announced and, you know, I was doing press, I was assisting with trying to get shareholders over the line because there needed to be 90% or more of the shareholding to have agreed the deal and uh, I suppose I was making phone calls to long lost shareholders and no one had I'd heard of for many years and uh, trying to pick a team, trying to get to know the team, trying to instill a bit of positivity in there, bring bring a, a better harmony into the place. But it was, uh, it, it, those first week, it was whirlwind stuff, you know, the, doing the media, etc. Everything that was going, trying to get the right message with the fans. It was all uh, helter-skelter stuff, but the one denominator was the dressing room was a losing dressing room and the players were frightened, Yeah, you know. It was uh, that, that's that's the outstanding bit, and and also there wasn't a great will for people to stay there, you know. Uh, I decided to see them one by one on that first day, and I did it in alphabetical order, not to uh, not to 
you know, favor anyone or people who might have been there when I was there. And uh, Ben Anik was, was the first guy in and Ben wanted to move. That, you know, he handed me a letter and said, you know, it wasn't even worth talking to me. Uh, and I asked him to hold off on that. Uh, I then asked him to send in, uh, you know, the next person and uh, they come in and went, yeah, I want to move. First three people in all wanted to move. And so uh, this isn't going well, right? So we've got a lot of work to do here. And uh, tried to make training a bit of fun. You know, we weren't there to... to uh, to, to become Pep Guardiola. We were actually trying to create a bit of harmony in the dressing room for the first few days. That's why Bobby Saxon came in to give me a help. Um, we, we were doing what we were doing. I think we went up to Carlisle on the Saturday, won a friendly, handy enough. The guys were in good form. We headed off to the first game then after a week's training. Plus, I'm still trying to get the deal over the line in the meantime, dealing with, with everything else, trying to uh, get players in. But of course, we couldn't get players in because we weren't allowed to spend money. Uh, the deal that, that Bob had done was, you know, that we, we couldn't spend money on the club's behalf if we weren't the rightful owner he'd let us in to, to get it going which was very fair you know yeah. not giving out about that and so we were on a few free transfers here and there trying to trying to get this thing going went up to Coventry I think first game um, from what I can remember Darren Murphy scored we were in good shape and uh, and then very quickly I understood why why uh, the, the club was in so much trouble the year before Coventry had a throw in not long to go our lads turned their backs Coventry score a goal and minutes later Stern John who we later bought scores another one and as tough as that was, the, the impetus that you were trying to, to get going with them, you know, the, we knew there was something there was something very big needed there to get that. And so we, we stayed at it. Bob and I stayed at it for a couple of weeks and we, we were a little bit alarmed about the um, the lack of belief in the dressing room that yeah. these players could get themselves out of this and, and that it was a new journey that they could go on. And we said it to them a couple of times, you know, there's something very big going to happen here. You know, you've got to try and prove to us you want to be a part of it. And uh, it, it obviously... Uh, coincided with us staying in touch with uh, Roy Solicitor to see what the story was and then eventually uh, we got the word that he'd, that he'd come back and so it all set up nicely we'd just been beaten by Bury uh, we got a man sent off in the first minute who we'd sort of done all our tactics around for the three days before him uh, are now Rene are now and he was going to be our main man and he got sent off before any of us had taken our seats so at that point I looked up and said God you don't really want me to do this job do you? <laughs> But um, but we were happy enough because we knew that Roy was favourable to come in at that point, and uh, w he didn't come till the week after. But we we um we had a game at the weekend against the league leaders. Word had started to seep out that it could be Roy that was coming, and um, and the players all played thirty five percent better on the Saturday. We beat the league leaders easy, and they were all up for it, and it was amazing. That was a little twist, even before he came in the door, he'd caused that, and. Uh, we were uh, quite pleased, Bobby and I, that um, there was something in there, that we weren't wasting our time and that the players could go into a better place. And then the deal itself went through and we were able to buy a couple of players and, um, you know, we, we bought them six on the last day. I think that's a pretty yeah. well-known story. And it, it started to happen and we went again then at the Christmas window and the, the, the march carried right on and we became a Premier League club way ahead of schedule, you know, and uh, it was it was a great time. You know, there was a, a wonderful feeling around the city, not just the football club. And we were back where we belonged and there was something really positive to build on. The connection with the with the fans of the community was strong and we started getting ideas about making things bigger and better. And uh, even the, the, the people who work at the club themselves, the non-footballing workers, if you like, you know, it was important that they bought into this and yeah. they were happy going in there. So we, we got it going, I suppose, is the best way of, of saying it. And it was hard work, but it was it was it was great. Roy did his stuff players started to to believe and then you know back in the Premier League we knew it was going to be very very tough but we got there to, to stay up that first year was was very important and also you know at times as, as that time was coming the, the world was starting to change and particularly Ireland because Ireland fell off the side of the commercial earth and uh, the collapse of the Celtic Tiger meant our Drumble Consortium had to readjust and their priorities of course were their primary businesses were you know hundreds of people were being made redundant and you couldn't just be seen to be sit on top of a football club yeah. and heading over to England every week uh, while well, all these problems, huge, huge problems were, were mounting in Ireland. So that was the point when uh, we, we, I met Ellis Short and Roy met Ellis Short and uh, and Ellis came in and Ellis gave us the opportunity to, uh, to go a little bit deeper in the transfer market and do a little bit more if we could get it right than just staying up on the last day, you know, and, yeah. and it, it took a while. Uh, but we, we got some very good players in. We went on, on various runs. Um, if I was to look back at the time, you know, uh, it, it, it got pretty, it, it got pretty tense 
with the first season un- under Ellis where we had to stay up you know just to make the the, the program work for him for the future going forward and uh, obviously Roy left and we had to uh, do something about him we said okay do we appoint another manager here that um we'll try and do what Roy did or do we try and get them back a little bit just to see out the season and that's where Ricky Sprague came in and Ricky got the dressing room back into a good place for a period of time uh, no disrespect to Roy but uh, the, the dressing room was confused a bit uh, at that point once Roy had left we said okay we'll get them smiling again and see where that'll do us and, and Ricky went in a great run until Spurs scored in the last minute here in a game we had it wrapped up and Ricky gave the players a load of stick on the TV and uh, the players as players do, they they um, they don't mean to do it, but the the performance has dropped off, and we just struggled till the end of the year, uh, and and limped over the line, if you like. Um, just rewinding back mm-hmm. slightly as well, mm-hmm. when with um with Roy, one one thing I was quite curious with, um, if it wasn't Roy, who would it have been that would the project? Well, would we, we spoke around? to we spoke to Martin O'Neill as well at that time. Yeah, uh, but his wife had been very poorly. Yeah, he'd left Celtic, so so Martin was uh, someone who we'd spoke to, and we had a we had a list after that, but we didn't want to go too far into that list. Okay, and we didn't want to uh, you know sort of interview people and say sorry, you, you were never in the in the role in the first place. You're never mm-hmm. in the hunt. Uh, we also um, sought permission to speak to Sam Allardyce, who was at Bolton at the time, but we weren't allowed permission to do that. So they, they were the areas we were thinking of, you know, um, as a group. Uh, but then, you know, the, the fact of the matter was, you know, Roy came back into into Vogue very quickly because he, he expressed, you know, opinion he had his holiday and he, he felt, yeah, I'll come up and have a chat and let's see where we go. So that was great. Yeah. And so the, the, our, minds, our minds were made up then, you know. Yeah. So uh, that's why I sacked myself after a great victory against <laughs> West Brom. Uh, but it, it all started to work well and it went right through then as, as um as I was explaining, where Ricky, you know, uh, hit the ground running with the guys, got them into great shape and then faded away. And and, and we both agreed on the last day of the season, we, we hugged each other in in a private room and we both agreed, OK, done the job. That's me. I'm, I'm a coach. Yeah. You know, Ricky was, Ricky's been, I'm a coach, not a, not a manager. And um, we've done the job and, and it was great. And, and then we were able to have a good look at what was out there. And, was and that's when Steve Bruce came yeah. out. We felt Steve was ideal now just to, to stabilise, maybe build a bit. And, uh, and and we had some good, really good times with Steve Bruce, you know. Uh, there was a label there, being being a, a Geordie, which uh, didn't sit well with a lot of people. Um, they, they forgot it when we'd have good victories, but, uh, you know, some great ones. Chelsea away in particular, I think, was yeah. one, that, one of my favourites. Um, but, do you know, uh, my, by the way, can I just say my favourite moment, both playing here and being involved in, in the administration of the club, uh, my favourite moment was Carlos Edwards' Thunderbolt to, to virtually yeah. bring us into the into the uh, into the yeah. Premier League. That was the that was the one. But going back to uh, to Steve's time, then Steve came in and and brought some shape into the planning. Uh, after you know, Ricky had kind of got us over the line, and Ellis was uh, was was good. Ellis allowed us to spend money uh, over and above what the club were earning, and so it it felt it was going the right way. It really did, and we had uh, you know, uh, I suppose a. Uh, a good go in the transfer market at, at that yeah. time. But we also, I knew I had to balance it as well. So hence, you know, Jordan Henderson went, um, Darren Bent, we didn't want to lose Darren. Um, I wanted to uh, touch yeah. on that actually. Yeah, Darren Darren was scoring goals, but, you know, in fairness, you know, when, when the agents are coming and, and telling you you can get a load of money elsewhere, you well, know, it, it upsets every player. It doesn't just upset Darren Bent. And what, so, what's the situation with Bent? Because, I mean, you're talking about the the project and how, how well we did under Bruce. And I, I really 100% agree that with Bruce, I wasn't too sure at first, and then it worked. We got those results. We had that at that times when we tailed off, but I think a lot of people would pinpoint what was our eventual downfall to where we sort of found ourselves maybe last season as mm-hmm. Darren Bent going. And we, we've spoke to Darren Bent. Connor mm-hmm. has spoke to Darren Bent previously, and I think everyone's got their own story. The story's story. quite easy. We were at pre-season training in Portugal, and his agent mm-hmm. turned up and said, uh, we want Darren to go. We've done a deal with a team in Turkey. Okay. So that was in the in the in the summer in the in the preparation for the season. We said, You must be joking, Darren's going nowhere. I said, Okay, then give him what the Turkish people were offering him. And mm-hmm. to give Darren the money that the Turkish people were offering him at that time to keep him happy was just impossible. It was just blown blown yeah. the blown the whole thing apart. And we couldn't do that. And uh and what we what we said, you know, Darren had got himself in the England setup great lads scoring loads of goals it was just this is a, this is the kind of problems that football clubs have you don't just have them when things are going wrong you have them on the on the upside as well and we we managed to fight that one off and went ahead you know with the with the plan um he 
car- carried on. He played. He, w- he was on the old wage. He didn't sign a new contract. And the Christmas time came and Steve came in to me and said, uh, if we get good money, can I spend it? You know, and uh, I said, well, yeah, well, I, I don't know who's going to give us good money. He said, uh, I've been told Aston Villa are desperate. And Aston Villa gave us a, a huge return on, on Darren uh, for it to happen. And we uh, we took that decision. And we, we took the decision, I suppose, because we felt Darren was playing and wishing he was on far more money than he was. And and probably rightly so, because others would give it to you. And for, for Darren to say we, we, we uh, kicked him out is actually not, not, not true at all. Nothing would have given us more pleasure than to give him a, a long-term contract with a with a pay rise, but not at the levels that other clubs were prepared to go. And so, rather than have an unhappy player there at, at that period of time, Aston Villa came in and offered us a, a huge amount of money, culminating in twenty-four million pounds uh, coming our way. Um, we just felt it was the right thing to do, and we would try and find a replacement for him and uh, and go from there. So, looking back with the money that the club spent, even in the six years after I left. Uh, you know, had we kept him, did it guarantee anything? It would have just guaranteed one thing. All the players would have come in and look for crazy money. And so you, sometimes you have to uh, do what's right for that, for the, for the balance sheet as more as just to say it was the right thing to do with the players. And, um, you know, and, and we took, we made the decision to, uh, to move him on. You also had another player, another person we spoke to. Me personally was uh, Asmo Jan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and he had a very similar story. Asmo Jan is the exact same. This is so, yeah. so whatever players say, I'll tell you what their agents say, and I'll tell you what goes on behind the tell scenes. Me the whole lot. <laughs> so, well, that's it. And so I told you um, as it is. But but Asamoa, Asamoa uh, came to us by his agent who said, uh, "I must go now. I have a huge offer in the Middle East." So we said, "No, we can't take that." Um, and we did the same thing. We waited a six-month period uh, for Asamoah to, to come back into line. You know, we give him a, 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 a contract with a pay rise, but it, it paled insignificantly yeah, to, to what was on, on the table for him from, from Alain and also the, the pressure they were putting him under. We were hoping he would go there for three months, hated and come back. And he didn't. No, he didn't. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, the, the fact of the matter was they were probably offering him five times what he was on with us and there wasn't we were told there was no tax on it so in theory he was earning 10 times more to go and play there these are the problems if we were up at the top and fighting for you know league title you know you you, and and you've got the kind of ability to keep players the way those top six clubs can then it would have been different but we were Sunderland trying really hard to keep everything working and if one of those players had been given the type of money they looked for I, 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 I certainly didn't want to sanction that because it was putting the club at a, in a terrible position of combat because we, we were never going to earn any more income mm-hmm. and we were up at the limit with what we could spend ver- bearing in mind that Ellis Short gave us a lot of, of money and uh, to go to an, another level would have just blown the club into a, into a dangerous position and, and we made that decision. It was uh, almost like a financial facts of life that we had to abide by and as Amoa went um, Jordan went we couldn't hold on to Jordan any longer so those three deals alone brought us in well over 50 million 50, 60 million so yeah. you have to do a bit of book balancing as well because Ellis had Ellis had, had done some some really good stuff you know I can remember when Catamol became available late on yes. and uh, we, we, we were managed to get him we beat off a couple of other clubs because we didn't split the fee we were able to pay up front Ellis allowed us to do that there was moments like that that people don't know or don't read about Ellis Short that uh, showed where where his his, his, I suppose where his metal was, and uh, that wasn't the only one. There was other other cases we were able to buy players because of that. Michael uh, Turner, I believe, was one of them as well, wasn't it? Uh, right. Yeah, I think there was other clubs in for Michael Turner. Yeah, yeah. Um, when when he came from Hull, and uh, and then when you when you do that, you, you you have to balance up the books, you know. And you see it this year. It's not it's not any different. But Maja this year, you know, I, I, I it was terrible that. Uh, his his development here was stunted by what happened, but economics come into play then, and I suppose you know, you, 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 I I understand exactly what the the board here were going through as that whole thing was was developing, and it's one of the big problems with with a club who aren't in the top six or top half regularly, you know, uh, the agents are, are almost saying, look how well my fella's doing at Sunderland, or look how well he's doing at a, at a club in the bottom half, he's going to do great for you, and and they're always then able to up the ante for the player that the player should be getting in terms of salary, putting pressure on the club to sell. And, uh, you know, we made the decision to sell because, you know, we we were in danger of spending way too much and finding the club in deep, deep financial trouble. So I made the decision to to really, with, with, you know, consultation with managers, et cetera, on 
uh, those two players that you mentioned. What you're hoping for is then that somewhere along the way you can get somebody in for half that or quarter that and they come along and start scoring goals. But that that, that was um, very hard to do. We tried, but yeah. it, it didn't happen. Talked about um, the situation and I think um, I, I can only speak from a fan's perspective. Um, I'm certainly no businessman, trust me on that. <laughs> um, when Ben went and when Henderson went, Jan went, we brought in like this likes of Seb Loss and Craig Gardner who, who mm-hmm. did a job for Sunderland, mm-hmm. very much so. But it felt like we like lost a lot of the quality quite fast. And I think that eventually contributed to Steve Bruce's sacking. Now, as far as I'm aware, Steve Bruce was always your man and your choice. Mm-hmm. He was someone who you backed a lot. And not too long after that, obviously that your relationship with Sunderland as a chairman and Ellis sort of, it, it felt like it ended abruptly. Mm-hmm. Um, how much of that was to do with, did you did you have maybe a falling out over the sacking of Steve Bruce? No, or a not at all. No, no. Um, I think it was the best thing for everybody. And, and even though Steve took it bad for a while, he ended up speaking to me again um, <laughs> because it just was the correct thing to do with where we were. And uh, Martin came in and I had three months with Martin. I, I can't remember losing a game. The place was absolutely flourishing under him. James McLean came along and lifted the yeah. the spirits of everybody when he, he came on as sub in that first game. And, um, you know, it looked as if it was in the right place. I had kind of done my time. Do you know, when, when, you, when you look back, right, so when the club was being uh, sold to Ellis, I felt I was part of Drummerville and we were all leaving and it was just yeah. Ellis asked me to stay. Yeah. You know, so um so I did stay and I was six years away from my family at that point as well. Uh, my kids' teenage years were non entity for me and uh, you know, a non event. And uh so I, I made a decision uh that at that point in time that, you know, my my life as Sunderland chairman was over. My uh value value life, if you like, because uh I, I'd had a go. I'd done certain things. It had gone to a point. It was somebody else's turn. And as it turns out, Ellis had, had found uh, some time then to do that job himself. And so it kind of, it was a, an easy enough transition. Uh, Ellis was pretty good to me on the way out in terms of, uh, you know, he, re- he released a lovely statement about me. I was I was happy I'd done what I'd done. It was a, a ballsy, brave thing to do for looking back for a, a player who um, had, had no experience in corporate finance or, you know, acquisition. And then to run the club and to bring um, my thoughts and ideas into into the club and to keep the books as balanced as we could uh, with Ellis's help, um, you know that that was uh, that was the added bonus, and it was somebody else's turn to maybe spend Ellis's money or or to um, or to bring a a I suppose a viable equation into play where the club could could go. And a number of people tried it after I after I was here. They mightn't have been chairman, but they were given the footballing. Uh, director role or what, I don't know there was a couple of different titles um, to people who came after me and and you know um, I know how tough it is so I'd never have a go at anybody here who 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 who, who uh, spent the club's money and things started to go wrong etc and managers and fallouts and you know it's part and parcel of it and the day you know you stop to think and say well do you know what I was better than him or he was better than me you're at nothing it's a really difficult difficult process and I felt you know, it was a good time to go. I felt the club were in good shape. They were in no danger of being relegated. Um, we were ninth, I think, in the Premier League the day I left. Yeah. Uh, I think we were still in the cup, getting ready to play Everton, if, if my memory serves me well. We'd just beaten Arsenal. Yeah, that's correct. And there was a great buzz, and I felt Martin had the whole thing in pretty good nick. Uh, it was time for me to go. And, um, you know, and it was time for Ellis to put his spin on it, you know, Um and and that was it. It was a it was a family decision as well. You know, I I hadn't seen mm-hmm. my kids' teenage years. You know, from twelve to eighteen, and I was never going to see them again when they left home for college and stuff. So, I made I made a, a conscious decision to get home. This is probably going to be a, a long winded answer because so I'll ask you to summarize it as best as you can. But I don't think you personally would have you know envisioned the way things eventually went under Ellis Show and and me personally I don't think I think it's hard to question his money and I think it's hard to question his intentions mm-hmm. I think there's other things that can be questioned definitely but in your opinion where did the Ellis Show era go wrong well I wasn't here when it when it kind of collapsed um you know you can point to to a lot of things I I, I have always tried to remind people the, the positive things that you mentioned that Ellis brought to the club to give us a chance to maybe become a top 10 club. Yeah. Okay. And that's where this club deserved to be. So I, I had those conversations and he believed in that and he went and did that. When I'm not here, I can't really speak to see how other people did what they did. And I just said a few minutes ago, I would never call people for, for getting it wrong. I, I, I just know how difficult it is. Um, I suppose 
you know, when I look back, I, I look at hard luck stories and the biggest hard luck story was England coming along for Sam Allardyce, you know, because that just looked the right fit at the right time. And that looked like it was all going to be up, 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 you know, um, and yeah. that, that match against Everton at the end of the season that came Brilliant. to it. You just felt, wow, this place is in good nick now. And then, you know, the the, the call up to England proved ill-fated for everyone, for England, yeah. for Sam Allardyce and for uh, for Sunderland. So so that was a, a, a turning point, you know. Um, the only thing I probably feel bad about, or not feel bad about, do I feel bad about? The only thing I would I would regret happening after I went, even though I'm, I'm, I've already said to you, people shouldn't do this. I couldn't believe the concerts were stopped at the stadium and the joy that they were bringing to the city for a couple of weekends every year and the income it was bringing uh, within the city, the visitors, the the, the way it was putting something on the map. And I, I, I was I was a bit disappointed to see that because I know how hard we'd work to get them. And then for it to end up in Celtic coming down and hammering us when it was meant to be a, an exercise for the for the better of the football of the club, um, that would be just one that I, I wouldn't have agreed with. But other than that, all the other decisions are really tough, really hard. They're made, um, you know, I, 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 why on earth would I, haven't had it so hard myself, why on earth would I try and work it out why other people didn't do it? <laughs> um, it was, it, it's not the easiest station. And uh, one thing I, I've always felt, and I never spoke about, uh, my time that much, maybe I'll have a bit of fun with people, say, yeah, it was great, did things, whatever. But to go in, dig deep and uh, and start rolling out blame other than yourself, I think you look a bit of a fool, you know. Yeah. Uh, I know how difficult it was. Bob Murray knows how difficult it was. Ellis Short knows how difficult it was. All those people who come after me in the director roles. It's 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 not the easiest job to get a football club. To, to, it's like a ship in dry dock and trying to turn it out and get it off flowing beautifully off out to sea. It's very, very hard. And I just had a go at it. And I got criticism. I got pats on the back. It, it comes with the territory. Uh, but the last thing I want as a legacy of my time here is to start blaming other people for what they did after me. I yeah. think that's that's pretty poor. So I've got two more. Sure. Um, I believe... And I'm saying I believe because you hear all sorts of rumours. Uh, there was a consortium that was looking to take over in the summer. There was quite a few, I think, evidently, before Stuart Donald came in. Heard there was some rumours they want to put you in charge. Uh, is that a correct rumour or not? No, I had um, I'd possibly up to about four different people. Some I knew, a couple I knew, a couple I didn't, who said they were interested in doing something at Sunderland. Would I be interested? And I said, well, no, but I, I, because it's just I'd had my ter- time at it. but. If you need a little bit of a hand to understand the club more, because I think sometimes in this case, people look at the, in, in Sunderland anyway, they look at the books and the finances and don't estimate the impact value of fans loving a football club in, in the manner of, of a club that I'd never seen before. And when that passion flows freely through the football club, how do you put that on the value of what you're buying and if you want to really weigh it up properly yes you get x in season ticket money you get x in tv money you can get x in advertising money you know but really you've got to add other serious things to the equation like the foundation and, and what that does for the city and the good that it, it provides and, and the goodwill that it the club receives from it um you know th- there's so many more attributes to the football club than just the finances when you're looking at it. And those who spoke to me about wanting to understand that and wanting to make that part of the the, the approach in, I suppose, you know, understanding whether they should buy the club or not, they were the ones that I spoke to and said, well, from my point of view, and I kind of said the same thing to to, to all four of them who who did show an interest in in maximizing that that impact that, that the people needed to reconnect with their club. You know, and and I I stuck to that. I didn't stick to to the other bits that that was their uh, world. And 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 as it happens, they fell away. And in the end, Stuart Donald came in quite quickly. But make make absolutely no bones about it. You know, however things work out in the next few weeks, whatever happens, you know, Stuart Donald and his team got two very important things right on day one. They reconnected the club with its fans. That that's that's not simple. You know, um, to win football club and and manage to do that. It, it, it was excellent, but probably just as important, they've got a fine manager. They picked and selected a fine manager that nobody else even knew about. Yeah. And I think there, there are two very big things that give the club a great chance. And so, you know, um, it looked like we'd got a bit of a superstar in Maja that was going to bring us all the way to uh, to promotion. But 
these see things are put there in front of you running a football club and i know the difficulties that, that these guys face and so just going back to um you know to to finish off the question and and was i interested in, uh, no i was not interested in becoming chairman of the club and leading the full sort of uh battalion of requirements that you need as a leader to make a club great again but had they uh i suppose put the foundation in there as an important and integral part of their thoughts going forward um had they understood the value of fan engagement which you know in fairness to Stuart Donald and the guys they did they went yeah. and met them and they 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 spoke and uh they were very very honest very open and and you know I admired it now I I didn't speak to them by the way uh as I said they come into it late but there's a lot to like about how that all uh took place and um I think you know it's uh it's good from the outside looking in because I'm still a fan. My, my son is a ridiculous fan, you know. Uh, he, he's um, he's he's my kind of sound box now. Everything Sunderland, <laughs> so um, you know, I, I, it's still very much close to me. But I had my turn. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I got things right. I got things wrong. I think the passion of the club came alive for a period of time while I was here because it had been it had been uh, you know tested to say the least. In, in the previous regime. And um, do you know, when I look back at it all, I think if I had to stop to think about it, even for a, a day after Bob Murray spoke to me, I probably wouldn't have done it. I'd have took the easy life. I'd have played golf <laughs> <laughs> and I'd have gone on TV and said how bad everybody else was doing it. Yeah. But sometimes you got to, you know, stick your, your, your neck out and, and take it, something on as alien as it was to me uh, in terms of running a football club and the business side of it, et cetera. But uh, but one thing I'd like to to think is that um, within the club itself, be it on the fan side, be it on the, the non-football working side, be it even on the football side and the coaching and the academy that we got the planning permission for, that Alice paid for, the, the, the finish off, et cetera. All the stuff that, that came, you know, I always tend to stay positive, you know. I don't I don't stop to think about, you know, the things that went wrong uh, for other people. I, I think about them on myself all the time. What, what could I have done better, you know? Um, other than give... Darren Bend five times that everybody else was on, <laughs> uh, which may have been the right thing to do, you know. And and I've re I've real time for Darren, I really have. He was he was looking to get the best for himself, and his agent was too. And I get that. Um, but having said that, you know, I'm I, I'm glad he didn't let his contract run out, and he went and he'd go for nothing, go for you know. Yeah. <laughs> so so there's a balance you have to strike with stuff like that, and um, the you know the same with Asamoah, you know, uh, Jordan. I wish we'd Jordan for one more year. Yeah. Now, because I think he struggled in his first year mm -hmm. a little bit. And I think we would have put the finishing edges on him a little bit better with one more year. Yeah, I agree. But then, you know, um, for a kid who gave everything to the club while he was still a kid, you know, uh, we had we had to think about it. And it really would have been holding him back if something had happened in that in that final year. And, you know, we, we, we would have, um, A, we would probably got as much money from him and he would have missed that opportunity. And and we always knew he would he would get there given the right ship to sail in. Yes. And um what's even more admirable about uh how he's how he's got to where he is now today is that it wasn't going well for him and there was even talk that Brendan Rogers might have let him go and gave him the option. But he stuck his head down like all good Sunderland people and worked his way into a brilliant position. I say it to people all the time. I met a couple of the players from the current squad, you know, um these people work hard. They're fanatical. This club shouldn't be in the third tier. It shouldn't be in the second tier. You know, but one thing they will do, no matter how bad times are, if you're working hard and you show bottle and you show a bit of heart for this club and they see you not going through the motions and not using it as somewhere to get your next move, if they see you buying into this and putting a uh, putting your life on the line, your footballing life on the line to get this club right again, they'll notice it, they'll spot it and you'll become somebody who'll get a big kick out of that uh, fan engagement. If you want to blame other people and say it's the fans' fault or it's the coach's fault, then yeah, take that option. But the ones who make it in Sunderland are the ones who stick their chest out and uh, brush away all the negativity and, and, and turn around and do it. And it means more when, when, it, when it happens then. Yeah. Final question for you. Mm -hmm. And you can make this as long and short as you want. <laughs> um, what do you view as your greatest success during your time as chairman at Sunderland? Well, um, where there are great success, where there are great successes, I don't know. Um, oh, look, there's a number of things added up together uh, that maybe make a little bit of success. Um, certainly wasn't managing the team anyway. Let's get that straight. Uh, <laughs> no comments. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do you know, 
the speculation when, when you're involved when you're involved in a football club and what people are talking about and people are thinking you're doing this and the press are there every day. Um, I think I think getting the club uh, into shape to believe again, you know, even if it took us three years to get back up to the Premier League, but to, to do that uh, took took some doing. But I didn't do that. I picked somebody who did it. Yeah, and and Roy Keane did that. Yeah, you know, and everything that happened, you know, Roy Keane lifted Sunderland as a city. He didn't just lift the football club. He brought a winning mentality and a belief with people that this thing can go forward. And the club meaning so much to people meant there other things in their life could go forward. Now that was the big that was a, a big gamble and a big risk because I hadn't spoken to him since we'd had the Saipan fallout some years earlier, and so for that to have worked and for the club to have benefited from it, yeah, it was a gamble. But um, I'd, I'd be I'd be really happy with that. Uh, and then at the tail end, I suppose, as, as you know, everything that happened afterwards, uh, that little things, I'm very proud, you know, that Gary Hutchison came to me and said, uh, I'll bring concerts to the stadium if you give me a bit of backing. You know, Gary was a young lad at the time and anyone else would have laughed and I backed him. And nine months later, take that, we're playing, I think they played about eight nights or six nights yeah. here in a row or something, Phew. you know, and um, and to see that happen to people and see the good coming out in people, because the, the the fans were obviously up and down as they are, as they have been in the history of the club, but the people who work at the club they were my responsibility. I was their kind of boss or their leader, and to see them recover from the redundancies that were made shortly before I got there to a to a kind of a a beaming place where people really enjoyed going into work that made me feel everything was good because then the outside world is good, and the connection between everybody was was worth it. So. Right, long-winded answer. You were dead right. But, <laughs> but in finalising it, um, I would say connecting all the parts of the club to feel good about the way things were going for a period of time. Brilliant answer. Okay. Niall, thank you very much you're, for doing it. You're welcome. It. Thanks for um, me. I hope you enjoyed it. Ah, yeah, it's great. Thank you. Perfect. No problem. Some exchange betting companies run short-lived promotions like months-long offers of low commission. At BetDAG, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDAG is changing for the better. For the better, like you. BetDAG, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly.